We said in the last video that the stroke volume is influenced by how much blood is in the ventricle right before it contracts. That's called the end diastolic volume. We're going to abbreviate that so we don't have to keep writing that out each time. So EDV, uh, let's see here, EDV, anytime you see this, this is going to be end diastolic volume. Um, that end diastolic volume. Okay, so what is it that influences uh, the volume of blood in the ventricles? It seems like that's something that, well, why would that vary? Um, it has to do actually with the blood vessels. So we're going to come back to the blood vessels for this video. And remember, um, the, the recall the differences, similar, similarities and differences between arteries and veins. So arteries, remember, remember they are more muscular. Um, they have to have more of a rebound in order to sort of propel the blood along. And veins, not so much. By the time the blood makes it to the veins, um, there's not, not as high of a pressure. And so veins don't have to have that same sort of elasticity. Um, however, okay, one consequence of that, the fact that they don't have as much muscle aligning them, means that they are more compliant. And so it turns out um, that veins just tend, they, they can stretch out more than arteries do. So as a result of that, just in terms of where the blood tends to hang out in the body, most of the blood tends to hang out in the veins. It's an easier place to be. There's not, enough, not as much of a driving force to, to move the blood out of the veins. So just looking at the distribution here, you can check out the pie chart, um, about two thirds of the total blood volume is in the veins at any one time. Okay, how much blood is in the veins then influences uh, how much blood ends up in the ventricles. How would that be the case? All right, let's just think through this carefully because veins don't connect directly to ventricles. So how does that happen? So um, if there's a lot of blood in the veins, essentially what's that, what's that going to do? That's going to slightly increase the pressure of the blood in the veins. That's going to make more blood flow into the atria. And then from the atria, uh, where does the blood go? It goes down into a ventricle. So indirectly, the blood return from the veins ends up influencing the EDV, which then in turn influences stroke volume. So we should look at this a little bit more. What are things that influence venous return, return of blood from the veins into the heart? We've mentioned blood volume, kind of thought through that one already. So the higher the blood volume, um, the more the venous return will take place. There are a number of things that can influence total blood volume in the body. Um, we're going to be coming back to this one in a fair bit of detail when we talk about the kidneys. Okay, so the kidneys are one of the organs that have a major role in, in just maintaining the blood volume, and that's through the pr production of urine, um, depending on how much water is shuttled into urine versus returned to blood, um, that will influence blood volume. Breathing itself, breathing actually has a role in helping to maintain the pressure throughout the body. Uh, kind of all we're going to say about that one for right now. Let's come over to venous pressure. Okay, so the pressure in the veins. We know that this one, uh, it's going to depend on how much blood volume there is because that will, it will influence how much the veins are stretched. However, there are some other things that come into play depending on how constricted the veins are. So are the veins relaxed or are they constricted? And that is influenced by the sympathetic division of the nervous system. There it is again. There are also, remember the skeletal muscles, usually veins travel next to skeletal muscles. And so if those skeletal muscles are active, then there's gonna be more pressure in the veins and that in turn will help um, return the blood to the heart. So several things that influence venous return. Let's come down to this one. I'd like to talk about tissue fluid volume a little bit more. We're gonna move on to the, onto the next slide and elaborate on this a bit more. Um, this is going to take us back to capillaries. Remember capillaries are the connections between arteries and veins. Capillaries are the sites where materials can be exchanged between tissues and blood. So the blood travels through an artery, away from the heart, travels through an artery, makes its way to a capillary. Remember capillaries are the very thin, uh, very 
small blood vessels. Ah, losing my words. Uh, very small blood vessels, and their walls are leaky, so it's possible for things to, to cross in and out of the capillaries. Um, fluids as well as gases can diffuse across the walls. Um, so what direction do things go? Do things leave the capillaries or do things come into the capillaries? This is completely tied to pressure. So in arteries, remember, the blood is pretty highly pressurized at that point. So um, from an artery, if the blood has just entered into the capillary, it's still relatively high pressure. So the net direction is going to tend to be out, out of the capillary. Okay, so water, other substances will diffuse out of the blood vessel into the interstitial spaces. So that's increasing uh, interstitial fluid. As the blood continues to travel through the capillary, it's losing pressure. And by the time it makes it to the end of the capillary and it's about to go back into a vein, at that point it's very low in pressure. And so the net direction for diffusion is going to tend to be into the blood vessel for fluid. Fluid will tend to move into the capillary at the, at the vein end. And that's facilitated by osmotic pressure. Remember there are dissolved salts and um, proteins in the blood, in the blood plasma, and so that will help to draw fluid in. That being said, okay, in general, the driving force for fluid to leave from the artery end of the capillary, usually that's greater than the driving force for things to come back in on the vein end. Okay, so there's an imbalance um, at this point in the capillary bed. At this point, we're losing more fluid out of the circulatory system than we are drawing it back in. And this is where the lymph system comes into play. Remember, we've got lymph vessels and they're often um, kind of side by side with blood vessels. And so what the lymph vessels do is they help to take up that extra interstitial fluid. If the lymph vessels were not doing that job, um, we would have a buildup of fluid in the interstitial spaces. So it's very important for the lymphatic vessels to, to do their job and to actually um, drain the excess fluid. A buildup of excess fluid is called edema. And there are a number of different reasons why edema might happen. One can be just if the heart is not functioning, um, if, the, if the cardiac output is not what it needs to be, then there can be a, a buildup of fluid for that reason. But there are other causes of edema as well. One is parasites. Some parasites can cause very severe edema because they end up blocking off the lymphatic drainage. So that just really illustrates the job of the lymphatic vessels. Um, if they are not working properly, then we can get very severe edema. This is called elephantiasis. This is caused by uh, parasite. This can happen for non-parasitic reasons as well. Um, one is just high blood pressure. Uh, so that kind of makes sense. If, the, if there's high arterial blood pressure, then that's gonna be pushing more fluid out of the circulatory system. The lymphatic system might not quite be able to keep up with the drainage that needs to happen. Um, venous obstruction, so if the veins are blocked by something, blocked off, then that's, a, that's essentially blocking a um, return pathway. So edema might result from that. If the plasma proteins are leaking out into the interstitial spaces, um, that's what's that going to do? You can think back to osmotic pressure, right? If you've got um, plasma proteins moving across the blood vessels out into the interstitial spaces, then that's naturally going to draw water with it because water is going to be trying to move out in order to equalize concentrations. Okay, so there are a few others there on the slide. I think we've covered the main ones. Let's keep going. Um, so regulation of blood volume. This is something that the kidneys have a key role in doing. And this is a negative feedback loop that we have visited together way back at the beginning of the semester. I think this was one of our first examples of a negative feedback loop. Let's take a look at it again now. Um, and I think it will hopefully make a little bit more sense. We're more familiar with physiology at this point. Okay, so let's just consider um, the initial stimulus here is dehydration. So not quite enough blood, um, not enough blood volume is present. So dehydration, this could come from a number of different reasons, perhaps not drinking enough or perhaps too much salt being ingested. Okay, in any case, um, this is the initial stimulus. 
that ends up resulting in an increase in blood osmolality. So you can think back, what is it that detects blood osmolality? We've got some receptors in the hypothalamus that do this job. So uh, right there in the hypothalamus and the brain is where this would be detected. That's going to initiate two different events. It's going to make you feel thirsty, so that will cause you to drink. Um, drinking, I forgot the G right there. Drinking, drinking water um, is what you would do as a result of being thirsty. That's gonna help to increase the blood volume. But there's also this other pathway that gets activated. The posterior pituitary gland is going to increase production of ADH, antidiuretic hormone. That is a hormone that goes and acts on the kidneys in order to increase water retention. So instead of losing the water um, in urine, instead we're going to take the water back up, the urine's gonna become more concentrated, um, and that water that was taken back up is going to be shoveled into the blood instead. So that antidiuretic hormone is really key in facilitating this to happen. Um, note about ADH, antidiuretic hormone. This promotes the reabsorption of water only. Okay, so the end result of all of this, sure, we increase the blood volume, but we've also diluted the blood in the process. Okay, so the urine is still flushing out excess salts, um, other substances, and um, and so that by by reabsorbing water only we've diluted the blood. We need to have a mechanism in place to adjust blood volume without changing concentration. Okay, so what if the osmolality was fine? What if you had um, been eating the proper amount of salt, so not, not having too much salt in your diet, um, and just the blood volume is, is too low? Maybe you weren't drinking enough water. In that case, there's a slightly different mechanism for control in place. So this is one mechanism of regulating blood volume that you should know through the action of antidiuretic hormone. The second mechanism that you need to know involves a different hormone, aldosterone. So this one is new to you. Let's go through this one together. Okay, so let's say um, that the blood volume is too low. That's going to result in a low blood pressure. So as a consequence of that, there's not going to be quite as much blood circulating through the kidneys. We're gonna come back to the kidneys later on in the semester. For now, just bear with me. Less blood flow to the kidneys. All right, so there is a section in the kidneys that can detect that, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. That's a mouthful, we'll learn about that later. Um, don't, need to, don't need to get too hung up on that right now. Okay, so decreased blood flow to the kidneys um, is detected and that ends up resulting in the production of renin. The kidneys produce renin. Renin causes an increase in the production of angiotensin II. Angi angiotensin II causes um, the arteries to constrict, and so that results in an increase in blood pressure. Okay, so that's a good thing. The uh, initiating event up here was low blood pressure. Now we've increased the blood pressure. All right, angiotensin II also stimulates the production of aldosterone. Okay? And what aldosterone does is ends up um, increasing the blood volume. Okay? So not only does angiotensin II cause the blood pressure to return back to normal, but it's also going to initiate events to increase the blood volume, which was the problem in the first place, might've been the problem in the first place. So aldosterone, this is the hormone I mentioned. It works a little bit differently than ADH. Okay? So ADH just promotes the reabsorption of water. Aldosterone, on the other hand, promotes the reabsorption of water and salt. So it keeps things balanced. It doesn't change the blood osmolality because it's absorbing, or causing the reabsorption of those two things in proportional amounts. So blood volume is increased, um, but it is not diluted. Let's consider what happens if um, blood volume goes in the other direction. So instead of blood volume being too low, what happens if the blood volume is too high, if there's too much blood in the body? Let's start up here at the top. So increase in blood volume, that's going to result in an increase in venous return. All right, we kind of saw that earlier. If we increase the blood volume, then there's just gonna be more blood returning from the veins into the atria of the heart. And the atria of the heart, this is a bit of new information about the heart. The atrium um, has stretch receptors built into it. 
So if the atrium, the upper chamber of the heart, the left atrium, if it gets enlarged, if it has to stretch to accommodate a lot of blood flowing into it, that has some consequences. A stretch of the left atrium causes activation of the vagus nerves. Um, this causes the brain to activate uh, the post, well, causes the posterior pituitary to decrease production of antidiuretic hormone. So what's the, gonna be the consequence of that? If we decrease the production of antidiuretic hormone, then the kidneys essentially are gonna be making more urine. Okay, so instead of reabsorbing water, they're gonna be trying to get rid of water. So that's gonna help to decrease the blood volume in the end. The other thing that happens as a result of um, the atrium being stretched is that the heart itself will produce atrial natriuretic peptide. This is produced by the atria of the heart and that goes and acts on the kidneys in order to increase the, secretion, the excretion of salt and water. So again, this is going to lead to increased production of urine, which will help to decrease the blood volume, which gets us back to normal. So that's another type of negative feedback loop um, to deal with changes in blood volume in the other direction. Speaking of the heart, let's revisit the heart for just one more minute um, to wrap up this section. The heart itself uh, has a blood supply. So the heart, it's not able to just absorb blood and nutrients from, from the four chambers. It doesn't do that. Those are pretty much isolated chambers. The heart itself has to have a blood supply. It is a muscle. It needs to have nutrients and have a way to get rid of wastes. So this is what the coronary arteries are. The coronary arteries are, uh, you can see them on the surface of the heart. Those coronary arteries are the blood supply for the heart. If these become obstructed, that's a really serious problem. Um, this is heart disease, and heart disease is a, is a major cause of death. Um, so right here you can see in this image of the heart right there, and you can spot that constriction. That's a constriction in a coronary artery. This is something that requires a bypass surgery. So coronary arteries, um, the treatment can, can be bypass surgery. To bypass a blocked artery um, is, not, is not a simple feat, but it can be done. And you may have heard of like a double bypass or even a triple bypass. The number there that's being indicated, that's indicating how many bypasses had to be installed in order to get around blockages in the coronary arteries. So circulation to the heart, this is something that can be increased uh, during exercise, for example, during exercise, the heart has to be working harder in order to get the blood supply out to the body. And so it's going to need an increased blood supply through the coronary arteries. So during exercise, there are some interesting shifts that happen in blood supply. Um, here's a, a good summary of, of circulatory changes that take place as a result of exercise. Um, so you can see the, the muscles during heavy exercise, the muscles do get more of a blood supply than they would otherwise. Um, important note, the brain, okay, regardless of whether we're exercising or not, the amount of blood that gets routed to the brain pretty much stays constant, and that's extremely important. Um, circulatory the cerebral, cerebral circulation is something that needs to be maintained very constant because if the brain is deprived of oxygen, the person's going to pass out and that can happen very quickly, can lead to brain damage very quickly. Within minutes, um, irreversible damage can take place if the brain isn't getting enough of an oxygen supply. So it's really important to maintain that constant blood supply, whether or not a person is exercising or just at rest. And that blood flow, how is that blood flow maintained? Remember in the brain, um, the blood flow is facilitated by nitrous oxide. So that's um, something that the brain, the brain can re release, the blood vessels can release in order to recruit blood, keep blood flowing to this region.